Hi, welcome back to History and Philosophy of Science and Medicine. I'm Matt Brown. Today we're talking about the philosophy of Karl Popper. Um, now, Karl Popper was uh, a philosopher who lived from 1902 to 1994. Um, he began his life and his career in Vienna, um, and uh, just like the logical positivists, and like the logical positivists, he fled Europe uh, during the rise of the Nazis prior to World War II. Um, moved from uh, Austria to New Zealand, and then later settled in England at the London School of Economics. Um, Popper was uh, a complicated thinker, um, one with uh, a significant following uh, among philosophers and also scientists. Um, and uh, it's interesting to think about his legacy uh, in the context, uh, as Peter Godfrey Smith says, uh, of the fact that he is by far one of the most popular and well-known philosophers amongst scientists. Now, um, early in his uh, intellectual development, Popper had uh, significant um, interactions with the thought, uh, and in some cases, the personages of um, the following four scientific thinkers, Sigmund Freud and Alfred Adler, the psychoanalysts, um, Karl Marx, the historian, sociologist, and um, uh, economist, and the physicist Albert Einstein. Popper in his youth was um, briefly a Marxist, um, definitely interested in um, Marx's radical thought. Uh, however, he became kind of disillusioned with Marx at a certain point. He was similarly interested in psychoanalytic theory uh, and actually uh, worked for a time um, as, a, as a social worker under um, the, the tutelage of Alfred Adler. But he became disillusioned with their ideas as well. He also attended a lecture by Albert Einstein that was very influential uh, on him. And uh, through the course of these interactions, um, came to, to sort of frame a lot of his intellectual development in terms of what he came to see as negative features of the thought of Freud, Adler, and Marx, and positive features of the work of Einstein. Namely, that while um, psychoanalysis and Marxism seem very impressive in their ability to explain and accommodate information uh, about a wide variety of, of things, um, it seemed very difficult to find uh, any kind of situation, real or hypothetical, that they couldn't explain. Whereas um, Einstein's physical theories made bold predictions that uh, could have turned out to be false. And this turned out to be a very, um, a very influential idea for Popper. Popper had many uh, works that we think of as significant uh, uh, books, wrote a number of books in the field. Um, probably the most important works of philosophy of science include um, the work he's most well known for, The Logik der Forschung, or The Logic of Scientific Discovery, published in German in 1935 and in English in 1959, um, as well as books that followed up on and developed his thought in further directions, including Conjectures and Refutations in 1963 and Objective Knowledge in 1972, although these are by no means his only uh, important works. He also published two uh, works of social and political philosophy, The Open Society and Its Enemies and The Poverty of Historicism. Uh, and both of those are characterized, I think, broadly, uh, as, we can characterize them broadly as anti-totalitarian, also anti-utopian, and anti-Marxist. Um, and uh, they speak not only, I think, to social and political philosophy, but also include um, some significant thoughts about the philosophy of the social sciences as well. But we'll focus, for our purposes, primarily on his philosophy of science in these other kinds of works. One of Popper's significant contributions to the philosophy of science is his articulation of what we now call, thanks to Popper, the demarcation problem. The demarcation problem is, the, is basically the question, how do we distinguish science from non-science, 
and particularly those those activities that are kind of on the border. They look like science, but you maybe don't want to consider them to be scientific per se. Um, at first, Popper characterized this question as a question of different types of theories. What would distinguish a, um, a properly scientific theory from a non-science or pseudoscientific theory? Um, and later, uh, even, in, even in early parts of his thought, I think he, he kind of shifts from thinking of this in terms of theories uh, and instead thinks of it in terms of the practices or attitudes of the scientists in question, although he's never too clear on that. I think it's worth emphasizing how different this, uh, this focus is from the focus of the logical empiricists. Um, the logical empiricists with their verificationism uh, and their, their, their interest in the concept of what is cognitively meaningful are doing something similar to the demarcation problem, but not the same. The logical positivists or logical empiricists uh, in, are, yes, focusing on science, using lessons from science, um, but they're, they're sort of waging battles, so to speak, in a broader philosophical context. They're interested in knowledge and truth and meaning um, in, a, in a broad philosophical sense. And um, Popper is not interest, so interested in those questions. He doesn't think that just because something is non-scientific, it's meaningless or um, false uh, or um, not a contribution to our knowledge. But he thinks there is something distinctive and important about science uh, that is not captured by certain things. And he thinks it's important that we not be, uh, you might say, fooled into thinking a certain kind of activity or theory is scientific when it isn't. Okay, and Popper's answer to the demarcation problem uh, is the doctrine that he calls falsificationism, right? Um, and this is probably what Popper is most well known for, his view that in order to be scientific, uh, a theory has to be refutable by some specific observations or some specific evidence. Um, so what characterizes science is that it takes risks. It makes predictions that could turn out to be false. Um, and uh, uh, it makes predictions about things that are novel, that we don't already have the answers to. And what characterizes pseudoscience, according to Popper, um, is that although it, it makes a kind of prediction or it, it makes empirical claims, um, those empirical claims um, are not risky, right? Um, because, uh, because even if they turn out to be incorrect, the theory can kind of explain that away. Um, another way to put it is that the theory can accommodate any observation whatsoever. That's a characteristic of pseudoscience, according to Popper. Now, there are some problems here right away. One, um, it's not clear, logically speaking, that you can pin down a false prediction to, to the theory, right? Instead of something wrong with the way you've described your observation or some other auxiliary assumption that you've made. We talked about some of those issues last time. So one thing that Popper is forced to acknowledge is that in a sense, um, whether a theory is falsifiable uh, depends on decisions made by the scientists about what to count as evidence and um, uh, where to when, to, when to say that the, um, the problem is the theory in question and not say your, um, your equipment, your, your um, observation equipment. Nevertheless, something for Popper is, is considered pseudoscientific if there are no contexts or very few contexts in which um, the, 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 false, uh, the false prediction would be attributed to the theory. So this is part of a broader conception of the nature of, uh, of scientific knowledge or the scientific process 
um, according to which there's, there's basically two stages to a scientific inquiry. The first stage, conjecture. The second stage, refutation. Popper's idea is that what scientists do is first, you know, creatively, ingenious, ingeniously propose theoretical conjectures. They construct theories um, and hypotheses, and then they test them in an attempt to refute the theory. Um, the main purpose of empirical testing for Popper is falsification, is, ref is refutation. Um, not adding additional evidence, not trying to confirm that our theory is true, but attempting to refute it. And the history of science, according to Popper, can be seen as a series of conjectures and refutations. Some conjectures last longer than others. Um, some theories may go without refutation for a long time, may be expanded and improved without refutation. But often you have, uh, according to Popper, you have theories replaced by newer theories that may bear some resemblance to the old theory, but um, which uh, largely represent novel um, and broader sets of predictions. Right? Um, now, this process of um, of conjecture and refutation and this notion that empirical testing uh, is largely a, a process of falsification or refutation uh, is part and parcel of Popper's commitment to inductive skepticism. So remember, um, we talked about the empiricists last time and David Hume was one who we consider an inductive skeptic. He, raising certain problems of induction, concluded that there was not really a, a logical justification for inductive inference. And we saw the logical empiricists attempting to give various uh, accounts of inductive inference and encountering very difficult problems like the Ravens problem and the Grew problem in order to, um, and they encountered this, these problems in the course of, of trying to come up with an account of induction, and there were some significant limitations to their ability to do so. Um, rather than uh, join the positivists or the empiricists in trying to uh, solve these problems, Popper rather embraced the conclusion that Hume came to that, that there ultimately is no logical justification for induction, that, that, that we can't generalize um, we can't confirm our scientific theories. We can only say that they are refuted or they have not yet been refuted. There's a certain way in which that makes a lot of sense, right? Because on the one hand, we have a very clear, compelling account of deductive logic, according to which generaliz universal generalizations are easy to falsify um, but impossible to conclusively verify unless there's a very limited number of instances of the generalization. Um, so, you know, all ravens are black is easy to confirm if you've got only 20 ravens in the world, but when you have uh, uh, an uncountable number of ravens and um, more ravens that will be born in the future that you can't count now, logically it's impossible to conclusively uh, demonstrate the truth of that generalization unless you can finally get all of the instances. So that's compelling on the one hand. On the other hand, the uses to which we put science in engineering, in medicine, in application, sort of require us to distinguish between theories that are well confirmed and those that aren't. Although Popper attempts to uh, address that in a way with his account of corroboration, it's hard to see how that account is going to work. So that's a brief introduction to the uh, to Karl Popper's philosophy of science. How successful was Sir Karl's philosophy of science? Does it do a better job of representing science than the image given to us by logical empiricism? Um, well, I look forward to hearing what you think. We'll certainly see implicit and explicit criticisms of Popper's views in future readings. Um, but for now, we can, I think we can think about um, the, the 
pluses and minuses uh, that we find in his views um, ourselves. And I look forward to talking to you about them in class uh, tomorrow or, uh, uh, or on Discord, perhaps. And I look forward to seeing you next time.